protect us from um, finding ourselves on competing sides of issues and from mask righteousness, thinking that somehow if we wear a mask or don't wear a mask, then we're more righteous than someone who doesn't. Lord, that might seem petty, but the reality is that's exactly where our hearts so naturally go. We want to justify ourselves. And Lord, we as the church are vulnerable to that as well. Would our righteousness be in Christ alone? And would that set us free to be humble and loving towards others? Lord, give us that shape and that heart as a church. Lord, we ask that you would come and revive our hearts. Come and awaken us with this uh, reality that we're walking through in the world. Would it be an opportunity for the advancement of your gospel? And we pray that as a result of this global suffering that you would wake people up, that you would create gospel opportunities. And Lord, give us the courage to step into those. Lord, would you be glorified and honored in us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, it's that time of the service where we are invited to bring our tithes and offerings. And I just want to remind uh, those of us here and those joining at home that this is worship. And that it is impossible to please the Lord without faith. And so as you consider giving this morning, I would challenge you to think of what is the act of faith that you're um, engaging in as you bring your tithe and your offering this morning. Um, whether it's at home or here. What is it you're trusting the Lord with when you give? And so just ponder that for a moment. Sometimes we get stuck in routines um, and we start to do things just out of routine. And we need to be conscious of what we're doing, especially in worship. So let me challenge you that. If you're at home, please uh, consider giving through uh, the PayPal accounts, which I think you can locate at gracetrenton.org or our Facebook pages. Um, if you're here, we have two baskets on the table. We're not passing them at this time, but we'll have two uh, baskets over here that you can put your offerings in um, as well. So let us go ahead and pray, and let us consider then this time of worship. Heavenly Father, you are good. All the time you are good, Lord. And we come with real thankfulness in our hearts. And you have given us all things. You've given us every circumstance. You've given us every job. You've even brought um, other difficulties into our lives. And yet you continue to care for us. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that our hearts would be full of faith this morning. Just now, as we even consider that we are back in this building, that you will not leave us, you will not forsake us, and help us then to acknowledge that trust, acknowledge our faith in you by giving up our faith and our trust in the things that this world has to offer and leaning heavily upon you, Lord. We pray that you would not leave us ashamed, that you would not let the world deride or mock us, that you would deliver us from all manner of circumstances as we place our trust in you, that eventually, Lord, we will know that your love endures forever. For we ask it in your son Jesus' name. Amen. So join with us as we sing, Jesus cast a look on me. Seeing on 
Thank you for allowing us to gather today. Father, I thank you that you have continued to provide for each of us, um, whether financially or emotionally, um, through your Holy Spirit even. God, I pray that we would recognize the provisions that you've given us, God, and I pray that we would hold them loosely, God, and offer them back to you in worship. Father, I pray that you would multiply the money that is given today. God, that the people of Trenton and Dade County would know you more because of it. Um, and Father, I thank you just for my friends that are here in person, God, and online. Father, I pray that you would continue to show us your mercy, God, and your grace. And I pray that we would um, be changed as we see your face. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Sarah. Would you now stand for the reading of God's Word? Our passage is actually one verse. It's Acts chapter 1, verse 8. That is page 965 in your pew Bible. If you need one of those, hunt one of those up. Red pew Bible should be nearby. But Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, page 965 in your pew Bible. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. And Grace is thankful that it was not a long passage with hard words. Um, let me pray for us as we come to God's word together. Let's pray. Father, I thank you yet again that we get to physically be together and open your word. Um, it just doesn't feel the same preaching into a camera screen. But here we are. We're your people. We've been given new life through the power of your word. And you have promised it is through your word that you continue to renew and awaken your people. We are in desperate need of the power of your word working in our hearts this morning. And that is well beyond anything I can do. But I praise you that it is the very own power of your spirit that awakens our hearts and uses your powerful word upon our hearts like a scalpel, like a double-edged sword, as you described, that pierces all the way down to the bottom of our soul. Do that this morning, Holy Spirit, in us. Revive us. Awaken us. Let us see Jesus. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, it is uh, really nice to not be preaching into a camera screen right now. So it's, uh, it's just really good to be together. Um, and I wanted to start off just sharing a little bit 
about a lot of what I've been thinking as we've been going through the past couple months, as we've been walking through this pandemic. And I've shared a number of these things if you've been watching the sermons or following online. But the reality is uh, our whole world has been changed. You don't need me to tell you that. But our whole world's been changed. And these past couple months have been incredibly weird. This is like a weirdo world. This is Twilight Zone kind of stuff, is it not? And even, um, I don't know about you, but there's been so much in me, this longing for this get back to normal. And, and some kind of hope that maybe we're going to turn that corner and next week it's all going to feel back to normal. And for some of us it might be, it might have been when we get to come back together as a church. And then you come into church and... There's odd masks and distance and we're spread out and we can't hug and it's just weird. And a part of the reality that I'm feeling in this time, I know many of you are too, is just great uncertainty. This has shaken the whole world. This has disrupted everything about normal life. And one of the things that I've been praying about a lot over this time is I've been trying to seek God and really praying a lot about, God, what do you want to do in this time? Um, really seeking to understand that um, anytime we fake a, face a circumstance in life, especially if it's a hard one, especially if it's one that brings suffering into our life, from the perspective of the Lord, it is actually not an accident, it's not random, but it is in the providence of our God, something that He wants to use to bring about an awakening, to bring about transformation in His people. And so I've been trying to look at this through that lens and pray a lot about, God, what are you up to in this time? What do you want to do in us? And there's a big part of me that wants things to go back to the way that they were. And probably for all of us that's true. But there is a part of me that doesn't. Because something has happened in me over this time. It's, it's woken me up in different ways. It's caused me to ask questions I wasn't asking before. It's caused me to wrestle with things in my own heart I just was not wrestling with before. And it's caused me to look at the world and look at our community and look at this moment and say, God, what are you doing in this moment? So when you come to Scripture, there is a familiar pattern that occurs over and over and over, where you're, whether you're in the Old Testament or whether you're in the New. And we see this reality that's true of our hearts is that there is a propensity in us to move away from God. There is a propensity in us for our hearts to become cold, for us to become hard, for the things of God to become stale to us. Do you know this experience in your own heart? It's a part of the reality of indwelling sin, just the sin nature that remains in our hearts that is so powerful. And on top of that, we live in a world that is in opposition to God. And we have the enemy, the devil, who's uh, prowling around like a roaring lion and seeking to lead us astray and deceive us. And because of all these realities, our hearts and our lives have a natural tendency to drift away from the Lord. You know, I think about that hymn that we love to sing here, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And I've so resonated with that one phrase in that hymn that says, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. That is the reality of my heart. My heart is so prone to drift away from the Lord. So we see this pattern in Scripture that God's people will drift away from the Lord. They will forget about the Lord. Their hearts will become cold. They will become independent and self-sufficient. And God will bring a crisis upon His people. Some great disruption into their life. And it looks like all kinds of different things in Scripture. But in response to the crisis, God's people are driven to their knees. They're driven to a place of dependence and calling on the name of the Lord, often in desperation. And, they're, and uh, it's a very corporate reality. They're, they're reminded of, oh, we need God. And they call upon God with great intens intensity. 
And God responds with a great empowering of His people, with a great pouring out of His Spirit, with a moving in the midst of His people that brings about awakening and new life and joy and power. That is a pattern that just takes place over and over and over in Scripture. And so if I've been ta thinking about this reality that we're in and praying about it. What does this mean for us as a church? A word that I've used over and over and over is opportunity. I actually think we're in a tremendous opportunity. And there is so much of me, like I said, that wants things to go back to the way that they were, but there's so much also in me that doesn't want to miss this opportunity. I don't want to miss the opportunity for me, and I don't want to miss the opportunity for us and for God, what God wants to do in this time. So we're looking at the book of Acts, and in Acts we see that pattern very, very clearly. Where crisis comes, God's people uh, come in dependent prayer before the Lord, begin to call upon Him. He responds by a great empowering and a pouring out of His Spirit, and they are moved out in bold, powerful witness. That's what we're going to see in this study of the book of Acts that we started last week, and we're going to continue in that today. And what I want us to be thinking about is this concept of revival which is simply God's power at work reviving and renewing His people. And we're going to talk about that, but that's kind of the theme I want to keep coming back to as we move throughout Acts, is what does it look like for us as a people, the crisis has come, what would it look like for us to be a people who are seeking a fresh moving of God's Spirit in our midst? So today we're looking at verse 8. We looked at the, kind of the whole chapter last week, and I laid out kind of where we're at in the story. Jesus has uh, been raised from the dead, and we see in this particular passage here the ascension of Jesus. And in between, he is giving instructions to his disciples. He is giving them their purpose. He's giving them, them their calling in the world. And in verse 8, which I want to focus on today, is really the heart of that focus. Now, one of the interesting things about verse 8 is that verse 8 is actually a summary verse verse of the whole book of Acts. It's kind of neat to see that. You know, all the commentators pick up on this, and if you were to investigate it yourself, you see what a neat thing that Luke is doing here. Ver verse 8 of chapter 1 is actually the summary of the whole book of Acts. The whole book of Acts is showing you this actually taking place. Look at it again. Jesus says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Now, next week we're going to look at Pentecost. It's actually going to be Pentecost Sunday. It's neat. I was kind of excited about how that was working out. Uh, we're going to see Pentecost, where literally the power of the Holy Spirit comes on His people. And then in the book of Acts, you see them moving out in powerful witness first in Jerusalem, which is like the immediate vicinity. And then you see Holy Spirit moving them beyond the borders outside of Jerusalem into Judea, which is the surrounding area around Jerusalem. And then into Samaria, which was uh, more of the outer regions of Palestine. And yes, the Holy Spirit's propelling them out into those regions. And then finally, in the latter part of the book, you literally see the apostles being moved by the Holy Spirit to the utter ends of the earth. And the book ends with the Apostle Paul all the way in Rome, which from the perspective of Jerusalem and Palestine and these disciples here, and that day was the utter ends of the earth. So that's the book of Acts. God's people moved out in powerful witness through the empowering work of the Holy Spirit. Now, here's what I wanted to, for us to talk about today. Two questions that I want to answer from the text here. One, what is our calling? What is our purpose and calling as followers of Jesus? And then secondly, how do we do it? How do we fulfill it? So first, what is our calling? So as I said, this verse is Jesus is calling on his disciples. But through them, it becomes our calling. As Jesus' disciples, as followers of Jesus, this is what Jesus calls us to in the world. We are called to be his witnesses in the world. 
That's his calling upon us. That is our calling in the world. Now let's think for a minute about what witness a witness is. You know, we could ask John, you know, John Huseman is a lawyer in here, and he knows all about witnesses, right? Uh, as a lawyer, your most effective evidence that you present is eyewitness testimony. And so what, what a witness does, and we probably know this, whether you've, maybe some of us have been called to be a witness before in court. Uh, I've never done that, but I've certainly watched a lot of like courtroom kind of stuff, and so I know how it works. I stayed in a Holiday Inn last night. So, But here's what a witness does. A witness is called to testify to what they've seen. Simply what they do. They're called on to give public testimony to what they've seen or to what they've experienced or to what they've known. And um, the reality of a witness, and this is very important for lawyers, is that you want to call a credible witness. You know, it's not just what a witness says, but it's also the credibility of a witness's life. That's an important thing, right? You don't want to put somebody on the stand that's utterly unbelievable. <laughs> Someone that you can't trust. It's incredibly important. So as we think about this calling that we are called to be witnesses in the world and that we might think in this pattern in the same way that we see this here, we might think of our witness in the world as having these kind of concentric kind of areas that uh, we might um, ask, where is our Jerusalem? Where is our Judea? Where is our Samaria? Where are the uttermost ends of the earth for us? Where are those places that God has put us, that he's called us to bear witness to the truth of who Jesus is? And that's what being a witness is all about. You know, sometimes whenever we think about our testimony, we think pri primarily about, let me tell you my story about what's happened in my life. And that can be a very important part of a testimony. But the essence of being a witness is bearing witness to the truth of who Jesus is. It is uh, giving this testimony that in a world that's filled with so many different gods and so many different idols and so many different narratives about how, uh, about the meaning of life and about where we should seek life and seek satisfaction, in this kind of world where there is so many contending ideas and so many contending gods, we are called to be the witnesses who bear witness to this fundamental truth. Jesus is Lord over everything and his kingdom is coming into this world and one day will visibly and physically fill the earth just like the waters cover the seas in the description of the prophet Isaiah that is our testimony but the important thing to see is that if our words are not matched by our life we're not a credible witness so a witness is not just about what we say, but it's about our life. You know, if, our, if, if we are proclaiming a message that is not embodied in our life, we as believers are not going to be credible. I think this is a great challenge and struggle in the church. You know, as I talk to people who are not followers of Jesus... I almost, to a person, hear the story of how the church has in some way not only failed to bear witness, but has made an, a non-credible witness. The people have not, by and large, seen the church embodying the message of the kingdom. So if we say Jesus is Lord and our lives do not look like Jesus is my Lord, we undermine our testimony. If people do not see through our life like Jesus is his king, if we're not seeking to walk in the teachings of Jesus, then our testimony is going to ring hollow. If we're not embodying the ways of his kingdom in our relationships, then our testimony is going to be invalid. If we're not loving one another, if we're not a people of grace and mercy and acceptance, if we're not people who forgive, if we're not people who serve, if we're not people who live not for our own happiness and comfort and security, but live for the good and the flourishing of our neighbors, if we're not living in that way, then our witness is not going to be credible in the world. 
But that is our calling. That is our purpose. We are called to bear witness in the world to the truth of who Jesus is and his kingdom. Now there's an irony here. And the irony is that Jesus would call these disciples to be his witnesses. If you know anything about the story, you know not too long before this, the disciples weren't doing so well as his witnesses. You know what happened at the arrest of Jesus, at the crucifixion of Jesus. These men that he's speaking to here, and he's actually saying, you know, hey, you are going to be my witnesses throughout the whole world. Those same people that he says that to, just weeks before, totally split on him. You know that story? When he's arrested, they just like vanish. And Peter, you know, I'm so thankful for the story of Peter. What did Peter do? Peter, you know, was just so... I, Maybe some of us relate to him. Peter was just so self-confident, you know. He would just blurt it out. And, and uh, Peter, at one point, now actually not too long before the crucifixion, you know, Jesus is, uh, he's talking about the cross. He's talking about, you know, I'm going to be crucified and tortured. And they never did get it. It didn't match their narrative of how the kingdom comes. And Peter says, uh, no, 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 no. And uh, Jesus says, uh, you know what, you, you guys are going to split on me. And Peter says, no, 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 not me. I'll die for you. I'll never betray you. Never, never, never. Be careful of ever saying that. And what did Peter do? Jesus told him, before the rooster crows three times, you were going to deny... Before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Peter, just weeks before this, had been asked on three separate occasions while Jesus is undergoing his kangaroo court prosecution... Peter in that moment was asked three times, Hey, you, you were with Jesus, right? And he says, No, I don't know who he is. No, I've never seen the man. No, I have never met the man. And then the rooster cries and he's overcome with shame. Do you know that experience in your life? Boy, I sure do. That moment, that opportunity to bear witness to Jesus, and yet you just chicken out. Or you just bail on him. Or you fail. Or you do something in some way that compromises your witness before other people and you feel such deep shame. Do you know that experience? I certainly do. It was a beautiful place where Jesus restores Peter after that. But nonetheless, here is Jesus saying to those people who are so flimsy, you're going to be my witnesses in the whole world. You know, what kind of lawyer calls witnesses like this? John, would anybody? And not only these disciples, what kind of prosecutor would call people like us? There's a great irony in how God does things. You know, if God really wanted to make this truth known in the world, surely he's going to bring evidence that's stronger than people like us to bear witness in the world. You know, we had a great conversation in our community group this past week. You know, we've been doing our Zoom community group each week, and we've had a discussion question each week. And this past week, we were talking about this. Well, what is the challenges for you? What are the struggles for you in bearing witness to Jesus and his kingdom. And it was an incredibly honest conversation. It was such a good conversation. And, and what you would have heard us saying, if you would have tuned in on that call, is you would have heard each of us saying, you know, I, I really feel like I struggle with this a lot. I struggle to be a witness for Jesus. I, I feel like I'm not a good witness. There's so many occasions where I don't know what to say. There's so many occasions where I shrink back from that opportunity or... Gosh, you know, the, the people who know me the most, when they see my life, they might not necessarily see me embodying the kingdom. And that, that was such a common experience is that we were so aware of our weakness in this. And listen, I felt that as much as anybody. You know, you might think, hey, here's the preacher man. Boy, he knows how to do witness. He's the ultimate witness. Let me tell you, that is such a lie. It is not true. I'm just like you. There's so many times where in an opportunity to speak for Christ, I want to shrink back. 
I don't want to get into it. I don't want to be known as like the spiritual guy. That's hard to admit. I'm the pastor. But like you, sometimes I, I don't want to be looked at awkwardly. I don't want to be laughed at. I don't want to be mocked. I don't want to make things weird in the room. You know, that opportunity where you're like, well, if I say something here, it's going to get really weird. And sometimes I shrink back. And sometimes, honestly, in my life, you know, there's these times where there's like ministry time and like on spiritual time and like I'm pastor guy. And it's very natural to kind of do that in those places. It's, it's very easy for me to bear witness right now whenever I'm in the pulpit. But there are so many times in my life where I want to shrink back from bearing witness. Where I just want to say, you know, where I, right now I just want to live for myself. You don't just want to be selfish right now. If I'm honest, there are so many times where I, like Peter, like the disciples, like all of us, fail to be the witness that we've been called to be. So what is our hope? How do we do this? That's the second question. How do we do this? How do we do this impossible thing to bear witness to the reign of Jesus in the world? And that is the most encouraging thing about this passage. And it's only in the power of Holy Spirit. Look again at the, the verse here. Verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You see, bearing witness is not something we do in our own strength. Bearing witness is something that we can only do in the power of Holy Spirit. And what's interesting here is that Jesus warns them against trying to do it apart from Holy Spirit. I love this. And if you look back into the second part of verse 4 where he says this, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, don't leave here till you get the Holy Spirit. Don't do it. Don't even try to go bear witness because you're going to fall flat on your face. He says the same thing in the last chapter of Luke. He says, don't leave the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. What an image. Just this being clothed with power. Have you ever put something on that made you feel just strong and invincible? Yeah, I remember back whenever I played football. I remember there was something about putting those pads on. Something about getting suited up to go to war. When I was in those pads... You know, I, I was one of those that liked all the gear. I liked all the extra stuff and, the, you know, the neck roll and all that. Because I was more about the gear because I didn't have much talent. But listen, when I put the armor on, I felt powerful. That's what Jesus is talking about here. you got to know where your power comes from. I want you to be clothed with power from on high. And Jesus says, don't leave. Don't go try to do this. Don't charge out into battle. Don't go, try to go be a, be a witness in the world without the, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Don't try it because you're going to fall on your face. You see this over and over in the Old Testament where Israel wants to just charge into battle. You know, they would go into battle in the power of God and they would have dramatic victory. Uh, dramatic victory. And oftentimes that victory would come by miracle. You know, God would intervene. You know, they're coming with their swords and and God would like bring a flood, you know, or something. And it was always this evidence that like God is the one who wins the war. Now he involves his people, but it's almost silly in the way that it's only him that's accomplishing the victory. And so Israel, after that, they would forget, oh yeah, the only way that we won was because of God. And they would say, all right, let's go take the next hill. And they would charge into battle and they would go ahead of God and they would not go in the power of his spirit and they would get routed. Over and over and over you see Israel doing that. You know, I think we do that all the time. We try to go and live the Christian life in our own power. I think oftentimes we think deep down that's how we're supposed to live the Christian life. But here is the most comforting thing about this passage. The Christian life is never intended to be lived in our power. He never intends for us to do that. The, the only way that we're going to live the kind of life that He's called us to live is in utter dependence upon the power of the Holy Spirit. 
We are in desperate need of His Spirit. You know, the Christian life is a supernatural reality. It does not work in simple human strength. It does not work by willpower. It does not work by mustering up commitment and white-knuckling it, and I'm going to do better next time. You know, some of us are, are battling things in our life. We're battling uh, patterns and habits in our life and challenges that just keep owning us, and we keep thinking, I'm going to do better this time. I'm going to beat it this time. And it's like, you can't. We're powerless. We must have power from on high. And it is only in the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit that we can actually live the Christian life. That is incredibly comforting. It's why the Christian life is not a burden. The Christian life is hard. It is difficult primarily because of our sin and flesh <laughs> and our resistance to this very truth. But it is not a burden. It is not a burden because everything that must happen in and through us can only happen by God's grace. And when we get there, it's so freeing. But we're so quick to move off of that. It's up to me again. So the question becomes, how do we do this? How do we get the power of Holy Spirit in our life? How do we get His presence in our life? And just look what Jesus says for them here. What does He say for them to receive Holy Spirit? He says, wait. He says that both here and in Luke. Again, verse 2. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father has promised. Again, at the end of Luke, He says, do not leave this city, but wait until you've been clothed with power from on high. Now, from this moment, you know, right after this, Jesus is going to ascend into heaven, and it is ten days until the day of Pentecost. It is ten days until they will actually receive the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, isn't that an interesting thing that Jesus says, wait? Do you know God says that over and over and over in Scripture? He's always saying, wait. In the Old Testament, wait is almost a synonym for faith. Why does he say we got to wait? I don't like to wait. Do you like to wait? I don't like to wait on anything. I don't like to wait in traffic. I don't like to wait in a doctor's office. I don't like to wait on my food. I don't like to wait on anything. Waiting is hard. You know why? Why is it so hard? Because when you wait, you're not in control. Isn't that true? When I'm waiting on somebody else, it's not on my agenda. It's somebody else's agenda. They're in control. And so waiting is incredibly humbling. And waiting brings you to this place of realizing, I can't control this. I can't make it happen. That's why we're so bad at waiting. That's why we get ahead and we're going to go make it happen, right, in life. But Jesus says you've got to wait. God is always saying to us, you've got to wait. And the reason is, is because waiting does something in us. It actually prepares us for the power and presence of Holy Spirit. You've got to wait. You've got to wait because in the waiting, you're going to get in touch with your dependence and your need. And in the waiting, waiting has a way of kind of focusing you on what you're waiting for, you know? I mean, sometimes when you're waiting on something, I remember, you know, like kids, if you're waiting for Christmas, what do you think about all the time? You're thinking about Christmas. If you're waiting for your birthday, what are you thinking about all the time? I can't wait till my birthday. You know, my kids, when we have something that's coming up in the future, like the more they're waiting, the more they're like fixated on that thing. That's what waiting does. It focuses you on something. So Jesus says to the disciples... You need the Holy Spirit, but you're going to have to wait. So what did they do in their waiting? It's ten days. What did they do with that? They go distract themselves. They go get into a new Netflix series. You know, they say, hey, in ten days I could knock out three series in Netflix. That way I don't have to wait. That's why I love Netflix. I don't have to wait. Right? It's on demand. Man, there's so much in our world that blocks us from knowing how to wait in this life. But if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus, you've got to learn how to wait. You've got to learn how to wait. So how did the disciples wait? They knew what waiting meant. Waiting doesn't just sit around and doing this. What did waiting mean? Look down at verse 14. 
Here's the description of their waiting these 10 days. Verse, chapter 1, verse 14. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. See, Luke wants you to know they were all together, and they were waiting. What were they doing in waiting? They were constantly in prayer. Prayer and waiting are synonymous. You know, some of us, we, we pray for something one time and it doesn't happen. We're like, well, obviously God doesn't want to give me this. It's because the waiting is a part of His work in our life. And waiting and prayer go together. Prayer is a way of waiting. It's a way of not making it happen on my own. It's a way of going to Him and saying, you know, I cannot, but you can. But i got to wait on you. Do it, Lord. Do it. Do it. Do it. You know, like my kids. <laughs> When they're waiting, they wear me down to a nub. <laughs> I mean, I'm just like, what happens with me is I'm like, no, not yet, no, not yet. And finally, I just get driven to the point where I'm like, okay, I'll do it. You know, Jesus actually told a parable like that. And he said, here's how I want you to pray. I want you to wear the Father down to a nub for what you want and what you need in your life. That's what they were doing. They were on their faces. They were seeking God. You know what they were praying for? Send your Holy Spirit. Lord, you promised it, and we have to have it. And send your Holy Spirit. And nobody left the room. They locked the doors. They wheeled in the porta potties. We're going to get on our faces, and we're not stopping until God does something. That's the kind of prayer God wants to do in us. So here's the application for us. I wonder what would happen if we waited and prayed like this. I mean, what would happen if we shut the doors and rolled in the porta potties and said, we're going to get on our faces and we're not leaving until you do something, God? Don't worry, we're not going to do that. But maybe we should. What would happen if we began to wait on God to send His Spirit and move? Are you tired of lukewarmness? Are you tired of those things in your life that just kind of... you keep going back to and block you from the, the greater joy that you can have in the Lord? Are you tired of those people in your life that you long to come to know Jesus, just there being no change there? Do you long to see God move with power in our midst? What if we began to call on Him as a church like this? What if we began to say, God, we want revival. We want you to come and move powerfully in our day the way that you have in days of old. We want that today. You know, with that word revival for us, that might have all kinds of connotations for us that are negative. We're in the Bible Belt, you know, and the way that you th we think of revival here is it's like that means there's a meeting that is scheduled at a particular time, and it means we're going to come together and we're going to muster up enthusiasm. You know, it's an evangelistic event, or we're going to get really fired up, and, you know, that's what we think of revival. But that, that's not what revival is in the Bible. Revival in the Bible is not anything you can do. Now, you can do things to bring it about. Obviously, that's what they do here. But ultimately, it's God's choice to pour out His Spirit. We know that He longs to do that. But that is revival. When God moves with power, when He pours out His Spirit upon His people, and when that happens, they're clothed with power from on high. We're going to see that in the book of Acts. So what happens when the, when the Holy Spirit comes like this on His people in an intensified way? Look, literally what revival is, is it is an intensification of the ordinary work of the Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do? Well, He brings conviction of our sin. He brings us a deep assurance of our salvation in Jesus, that a deep assurance that we're really His sons and daughters, this deep experience of intimacy with the Lord. Uh, he brings joy. He brings empowerment and witness. He brings boldness. He removes fear. He brings His fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. Do you want those things in your life in greater measure than you have them now? See, revival and awakening and renewal is when the Holy Spirit comes 
in an extra intense way and brings all of those things with greater intensity. Joy, assurance, power and boldness. Is that what we want? Because if we want it, we could ask for it. And we can seek His face. We have to wait. I don't know when. I don't know how long. They had to wait 10 days. I don't know how long we wait. That's up to God. But the question is, will we seek Him for it? Will we pray together? This is going to take more than pastor. I mean, honestly, pastor only partly wants this. There's a part of me that longs for this, and there's a part of me that's like, hey, just kind of like status quo here. Okay, so you just need to know my heart's divided. So if yours is, mine is too. But we need each other. You can actually say, hey, let's pray. Let's pray. Let's go for this. As we start saying that to each other, you know what begins to happen? We start to long for it more. We start to call on it together. And then God will come. Let's seek revival together. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, I confess that I constantly try to do this thing in my own power. We all do, Lord. We're just so hardwired to think that we got to earn it and we can earn it and we can uh, better ourselves and we can do this in our own strength. We're constantly forgetting you. We're constantly doubting your grace. But we are in desperate need of your Spirit. We cannot do anything apart from the powerful moving of your Spirit. And if truth be told, we've learned how to do the Christian life almost apart from your Spirit. Would you give us a spirit of prayer? Lord, would you, in this moment of crisis, cause us to embrace our need in this time? Lord, the, the temptation to check out and, and, and run to other things and distract ourselves is almost overwhelming in this moment. But I pray that for us as a church, we would begin to call on the name of the Lord. That we would begin to seek your face and plead with you to move in our midst with fresh power, to come and to awaken the hearts of your people. Lord, we long for you to do that in our day for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You stand and worship with us and join us as we sing Build Your Kingdom Here. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
just saying, we are the church, we are the hope on earth. What an audacious statement. Do you believe that? People like us in all of our weakness, the hope of the world, only in the power of Holy Spirit. So don't join hands, unless your roommates or family, and receive God's benediction. Here's God's word of power spoken of you as people. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or even imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now go in peace to love and to serve the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So we'd invite everybody to mosey outside to visit. Do visit, but do it outside. Thank you.